G'day everyone, welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to be forging a full tang uh, knife from start to finish, every hammer blow, out of this piece of inch by quarter inch uh, 1084 high carbon steel. Uh, stock selection is something I may talk about later, but for now, as you can see, I'm making a start on the preform, and uh, we're using the horn and the flat of the anvil to just dress a slight curve into the tang. Now I always, on a full tang knife, will start the tang first, uh, and I'll always start from the very rear of the tang and move towards the tip of the knife, so you want to move in stages. At the moment I'm creating a profile and then I dress the thickness, so um, as we're going we're going to be upsetting a little bit of the material, making it bunch at the corners as you would see, and that's going to create a little bit of swelling and we're going to have to dress that down. And once I've created a curve that I feel is adequate, I'm going to then draw the material sideways out to get a little bit more width in the butt, because I want it to taper from the junction with the blade, the ricasso area, and the butt of the handle. This can be done with a flat uh, hammer, or a rounding hammer. Um, the face of my English cutlass hammer, which you can see me using here, is slightly rounded, as you'll notice. And so I'll just use overlapping blows to draw that width out and also gain a little bit of length. But as you'll notice, I'm creating a taper at the same time. This is going to be a tapered tang knife. And so therefore I'm, I'm starting my tapers already. And uh, I want to kind of create the taper as I'm creating the profile. Because if I create the profile exactly to the right length and then taper it, I will end up with a handle that's too long. Uh, having a little bit of extra length in the handle isn't a bad thing, uh, it's a good way to be able to dress out, but you basically want all of your main components, all the main parts of your profile, to be laid out properly before you go to the grinder uh, to true up the profile. So, as you can see, the taper is established, and I want to start with an obtuse taper, and then extend the taper out to the ricasso point, because that's going to be our thickest point on the knife. And as you can see, as I draw out the taper, I'm then going to refine that curve in the handle. And uh, it's really important at this stage that I make sure that that curve is two fingers width. Because half of the handle is going to be two fingers width, and then the other half is going to be another two fingers width. Uh, for most people, that's going to be between four and four and a half inches. Uh, some people have larger hands, some people have smaller. I tend to go for four and a half inches in my handles because that fits my hand, which is a large hand, and so smaller hands will fit that. And because this is a, a fighter style knife, uh, I'm going for a slightly more contoured handle. If you were doing a more traditional knife, you may want to go for a straight handle. That will entirely depend upon the end result of what you're aiming for. Now, um, there is something to be said for not forging in a taper during the forging process of a full tang knife, mainly because uh, it's hard to get it very flat and straight, because straightness requires that both ends are driving in towards the center line rather than following the parallel of the center line. Um, if you have like the enough material to make a flat tang, I'd actually recommend it and then grind your taper in later, and that way you're going to uh, be able to mark out a center line. But uh, given that I had, I wanted more width than the bar would give me, I'm using the taper to also give me that width. And now that I'm cutting it off, I'm obviously cutting off at an angle with the longest part of the blade, the part that's going to have the point on it, being towards the bottom of the blade, because uh, as we bevel, that uh, point is going to be pushed upwards and going to become uh, a central tip, or actually just slightly higher than a central tip, um, in the final piece. You don't need to get it off in one heat. I decided that I was going to because I was stubborn. <laughs> uh, and you don't want to cut all the way through. That black line is just where the hot cut was cooling the material. And then I just break it off over the anvil. You really don't want to be swinging a hammer around the hot cut hardy either. It's dangerous for your fingers, but I was well away from it while I was doing this little tap job until it finally broke. And here you can see me pushing that cut down. Now something to be very aware of if you're using a hot cut hardy to do the cut 
is that it will create an angled cut surface rather than a flat one. And when driving it down, it's going to want to roll over on you rather than uh, forge straight down. And so you're going to have to be very careful that you don't create a cold shut over the tip uh, when forging it in. So constant dressing of that uh, that flat, that width, uh, the thickness, I should say, is what you want to look for. And once it's too cool, you throw it back in the forge. Now, we're just chasing that uh, that nose down and one of the things you want to keep in mind is that the longer that your taper is, the longer that the vertical taper is, uh, the longer the point, the longer the, the taper of the blade is going to be. So if you want a fairly obtuse clip point on something or if you want a very elegant, long, slim flowing blade, then you want uh, you'll decide on how much of an angle you want. I wanted a kind of uh, a middling length of clip for this. This is going to end up being a harpoon point blade, and I'll actually show you how I forge in the harpoon point later. But um, once I've established the length of point I want, I'm actually going to start establishing my distal taper. Now you could do this with a cross pin or a straight pin, which I have done previously, but in this case I just use the flat of the hammer and I'm actually tilting the hammer over slightly to use the edge of the hammer kind of as a fuller. And Using this means that I'm going to have to come back and dress the height of the blade. The, um, you can see that it's getting quite a bit wider at the point than I need it to be. Um, but that's fine. Uh, I can slowly massage it out and it gives me a little bit more control in the long run over the actual thickness. Because using a cross pin, it's very easy to overforge because of the smaller surface area of the pin compared to the flat of a hammer. And once I've dressed it back to standard thickness, you'll see that the uh, profile is starting to get a little bit more recognizable as a knife. And the blade is tapering from the ricasso area, or so the end of my handle, uh, to the point, and from the end of the handle to the butt of the handle. So now comes the important part where we strike in the bevels. I'm lining up where I want the Ricasso to be, where I want the plunge cut to be, and I'm using the edge of my hammer and the edge of the anvil, as you can see there, to chop in the plunge cut. Very careful, very precise blows, all right at that edge, angling the knife very slightly uh, against the anvil face and angling the hammer face. Uh, to match the angle between the blade and the anvil so that the hammer and the anvil face are creating an angle that then the uh, blade is actually bisecting. In this case, I wanted to uh, have a plunge cut that was angled towards the blade, makes it look a little faster um, then. So I'm going to actually angle the blade backwards on the anvil face to have that plunge cut match the line of the anvil. And this is the point where you really want to be careful with your hammer blows. I'm working no higher than two-thirds of the height of the blade and bringing that material down along the line of the plunge cut to establish the blade, uh, the eventual blade width. If I'm forging the main bevels as I'm moving down the blade now, I'm doing a half face width of forging. So where my hammer face was before, I am overlapping that by half a hammer face and I'm bringing that half hammer face worth of material down to the same thickness and height as the previous part of the bevel. But I have to be, I don't have to be quite as careful as when I was doing the plunge cut because uh, I'm no longer trying to use the edge of the hammer to dictate the line. But you will notice that I keep holding the blade at an angle to the anvil because I don't want to bring the set down of the plunge cut onto the anvil because the act of forging could potentially actually mash the edge over to one side and then my blade bevel would no longer be central.
it pays to mention here at this point that um, I'm trying to match the thickness of the edge along the entire edge. Because the bar was even thickness when I started, there shouldn't be any ripples in the edge of the blade uh, in height. There shouldn't be any ripples because uh, if you're forging even flat bevels of the same dimension, they should all come to the same point in the blade. If there are any ripples, that means there are slight deviations in the thickness of your material, and you may need to come back and dress the bevel. I'm not taking this to final dimension because, of course, as we forged the bevels, the blade has taken on quite a bit of a swoop. Some bladesmiths will prefer to pre-curve their blades before going to this stage, uh, so curve the blade into the edge so that when it, they all forge the bevels, it actually swoops it out into a straight blade. I prefer uh, my method, which is to forge the bevels in from a straight bar and then use a block of wood or a wood baton to straighten out the blade and uh, get that all straight which, again, which is something I will show you in a minute. But that's why I'm actually leaving it a little bit thicker and then after I've straightened it out I'll come back and do a planishing heat where I'll planish a little bit more than what I'm doing here. Just clean up everything, get the angles right, bring that heel down a little bit more and really establish that profile, because at the end of the day, we want the profile to be the main goal. Uh, most of the thickness and stuff like that is gonna end up getting ground anyway, especially if we're doing a very clean um, ground knife. And so having a little bit extra thickness uh, width-wise is fine, but the profile is something we wanna do less grinding on. So I'm gonna use my uh, nice forging step on my anvil. You could use the length of your anvil, and I'm just gonna forge that down and it pays to have a hammer on hand because given that the bevel is thinner than the rest of the material on the blade it will bend over as you straighten but that's fine because you can just tap it back into place it'll upset into itself if there are any dents and then we can start dressing everything a bit more Now I flip the uh, blade around again because I need to establish that ricasso area a bit better. I want the handle to taper twice. So I want the taper of the curve, but then I also want to taper from the belly up to the ricasso to give me a real uh, place for my fingers to feel secure on the blade. Uh, this point needs to be done after doing the beveling because otherwise you can create cold shots and steps in the blade that you don't want. Uh, and so this means that I can dress my profile a little bit easier without having to worry about deforming the, uh, the blade area of the knife. And now we're just going to keep doing the same thing. You could use the edge of the anvil to cut the shoulder in, uh, as I did earlier, or you can use the edge of the hammer. Now this requires that you're a little bit better controlled with the hammer, um, and it takes a little bit of practice to get accurate, but uh, you can use the edge of the hammer to chop in that ricasso area. And again, I'm just planishing the tang, trying to make it flat and even, and make that taper super even. Both sides should be perfectly flat and just tapering in towards each other uh, to some finite area off in the distance. More refinement, more refinement, more refinement. <laughs> actually went off screen for a second there to use the square horn of my anvil to um, dress that radius in there because the butt of the handle was actually touching the handle face. And now I'm going to use the horn to just swoop that handle a little bit more. Handle shaping is one of those things that can be a little bit uh, iterative. You can, you know, play with it, find what shape works for you, uh, and then once you're happy with it, that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, I, I had a specific idea in mind and was chasing it in this build. I will mention now that um, having bladesmith tongs is incredibly useful for this. 
Now, while forging the uh, harpoon point, again, all I'm doing is beveling. Uh, I'm beveling at a little bit more of an extreme angle than I was with the initial bevels, because you're wanting to create a much shorter bevel, a much narrower bevel than the main bevel on the blade. Uh, and so I'm just going to work both sides, and the reason we work both sides, both on the bevel and on the harpoon, is because you're always going to have a little bit of bias between the anvil face and the hammer face, and you're not always going to have the blade at the right angle, and so keeping the um, blade moving back and forth between left and right hand forging means that you're normally going to even yourself out, and that'll leave you less trouble when you come to do all of your finish straightening, which will happen very soon. So, this last heat, I'm just going to use uh, my eye to tell whether or not I'm straight, whether everything's central, and I'm going to use this heat to get everything perfectly straight. Now, straightening can be done at a black heat. Um, steel moves faster when it's hot, obviously, but uh, when you're straightening, you're not really trying to move the steel, you're just trying to bend it. Uh, and I'm going to give you a visual representation of how I look for straightness. Uh, but I will tell you right now that if you haven't got yourself a set of bladesmithing tongs, uh, if you're making knives of any kind, it is incredibly useful. And uh, if you can't make them, or if you haven't made them before, uh, maybe investigate how, or find someone to make them for you, or buy them. Uh, but they're very, very helpful. Now just to uh, add a little extra swoop to the handle, I actually use this wood block and a handle face to introduce a little bit of curve keeping that heat isolated to the handle, and that's going to give me the final curve of the blade that I really want over the curve of the handle, I should say. And then I'm going to true up all of our flatness and straightness, and we're going to be ready to go to the grinder. You see a lot of people looking for straightness down the length of the tongs, but you can't see anything. Point the blade towards you, both edge up and edge down, and you'll be able to see much better if your blade is straight. This just acts on the way that the eye works. This is a representation of that. Looking down the length, it's actually hard to see. It almost looks like the blade is bent. But if we point it towards ourselves, which was very hard because I couldn't see a viewfinder at this point, you can actually tell that it's straight. I'm just not pointing it at the camera. <laughs> now, if we know that the blade is bent sideways, either left or right, then the bend is going to be straight down the blade. And so to fix that, all we need to do is lay the bevel on the anvil and strike down the length of that line, basically right, wherever the bend is, whether it be close to the tip or the heel. If, however, the blade is twisted, you could fix it in the vise by twisting it, but a twist is actually a bend on an angle. And so actually what happens is, is that the, a twist to the left, like this, is actually going to be twisted or bent along that line. And so you treat it like a bend and just hammer along that line and you'll take the twist out. Same thing goes if it's twisted to the right. At the end of the day, if you're twisted to the right, you're going to end up hammering along the opposite diagonal line. And this counts for anywhere on the blade. And this is something that uh, Japanese bladesmiths have been doing for many, many years to deal with twists. And a final overview of the blade, you can see that we've got our tapers in, our plunge cut. It tapers from tip to the ricasso, and then from the butt to the ricasso. It's dead straight, everything's nice and central. The plunge cuts are central, and that's really important. Uh, you want to make sure that your plunge cuts are cut in well. Uh. 
Thanks for watching guys, hope you enjoyed this little video on how to forge a full tang knife or how I go about forging a full tang knife. There are many ways to skin a cat uh, as the saying goes and this isn't the way, it's just my way. There are many other different styles but uh, hopefully you may have gleaned something uh, from this process. I plan on doing another uh, video next week, next Wednesday will be uploaded on um, forging a hidden tang knife, uh, how I go about forging a hidden tang knife in a slightly different pattern to this one. Um, obviously, there are variations that you can do on the handle and the blade and all that kind of stuff uh, according to your own personal taste. This was just one specific way to go about forging a full tang knife. With that being said, I would like to say a huge thank you to my patrons, who I will hopefully remember to put right here. <laughs> Um, I have forgotten the last couple of times and it's been really bad, but uh, they have been so supportive during this time and they've made it possible for me to make educational content like this for you guys. So if you want to help me uh, make more content like this, then head on over to Patreon, links in the description below, and uh, you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month and you get access to behind the scenes stuff and more classes much like this one. Uh, also, I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone who subscribed to this channel. We recently passed 6,000 subscribers. And uh, it's just amazing how many people have, you know, breached into my life from this YouTube channel and from my other social medias to, uh, you know, support me and keep this community growing. And it's just amazing. So thank you all for being here. Anyway, with that being said, I will see you next time. Bye, guys.